Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Huang. I'm the Medical Director and Health Authority with Austin Travis County Health and Human Services Department. And you may wonder why am I here uh, introducing our uh, speaker tonight on uh, developing trends towards walk walkable urbanism. And it really is um, a reflection of the tremendous partnership that we feel between the Austin Travis County Health and Human Services Department, Planning Development Review, um, Public Works, and many of our other partners uh, at the city departments that really have this common interest in promoting uh, this walkable urbanism uh, concept. You know, um, in, from my perspective, and it was interesting uh, talking to uh, Mr. Weinberger before the talk about, you know, we have these different circles and different people that we generally work with that there's sort of con growing connections now between our worlds and, and his world uh, between and, and this interest in, in promoting this. And, you know, from our perspective at the health department, uh, we deal with the leading causes of death in Travis County and in Austin, and it's, you know, cancer and heart disease and stroke. And many of these are related to um, physical activity and obesity and the diabetes burden and the costs that we see uh, in, in our health, de health department and, and those burden of disease in our community are directly related to physical activity um, that is really addressed by some of the issues that we're all here to talk about tonight. You know, I have some slides sometimes that I show uh, because historically in the health world, We've dealt with, with the obesity epidemic by trying to do education programs. And we say, you know, to, we'll do this intensive program to get people to try to lose weight or increase their physical activity. And for six months, maybe, we'll show an effect. And then after that intensive intervention is over, then the effect goes away and people gain that weight back or they drop off on their physical activity levels. And, and you know, what, what we've been looking at in public health is to really change the environment, change systems for the long-term effect. And um, I heard Mr. Leinberger, I had the opportunity to hear him at the Public Health Committee uh, this afternoon, sort of a preview, and he, he made the point of make the right thing easy. And that's exactly what we're talking about in public health, is making the healthy choice the easy choice, because that's really the type of things, changing the social norms, changing, making it easy for pub, uh, people to get physical activity and, and make that link into this urban design. And so that's a big uh, sort of a connection that public health and planning and everyone are making now more and more. So it's really a privilege to be here. I do want to first uh, acknowledge some of the other sponsors. And, and one of the reasons I'm here also is that we've been able to use some of our federal dollars that we have for public health. Uh, community, uh, Austin was a um, privilege to be a recipient of the Community Transformation Grant uh, funding from the Centers for Disease Control uh, and Prevention, which is actually funding funded partly out of the uh, Health Care Reform Act. It's the Public Health and Prevention Fund in that. And it's to really promote policy system environmental changes to address obesity, physical activity, tobacco use, um, and some of the other chronic diseases. And so that's part of why we're there. And, and so some of the other sponsors that are making this event possible include the Downtown Austin Alliance, uh, the Congress for the New Urbanism, the Austin Board of Realtors, the Urban Land Institute, the American Planning Association, and American Institute of Architects. So again, all of those uh, partners, uh, tremendous partners in help, helping make this happen. So again, it's a real privilege to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, Christopher Leinberger. Um, he's a land use strategist, developer, professor, and researcher, and author. Um, he balances the business realities with social and environmental concerns. His work in real estate and development centered around the concept of walkable urbanism, and he's, uh, he's accomplished so many things in so many ways. He's, he's currently or the non-resident senior fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution, where he focuses on research, strategy, and management of walkable urban places. He's president of LOCUS, which is a nonprofit group of responsible real estate developers and investors uh, advocating for the upcoming transportation, tax reform, and energy bills before Congress and at various states and metropolitan levers, levels. Um, he's the Charles Bendit Distinguished Scholar and Research Professor at George Washington University, a founding partner of Arcadia Land Company, which is a new urbanism transit-oriented development firm dedicated to land stewardship and building a sense of community. And he's, he's an author. He's written two books and contributed chapters to nine others. Uh, he was just published um, 
Uh, DC, the walk-up, wake-up call, a study detailing the rise of Washington, DC as a model of walkable urbanism. And his most recent book, The Option of Urbanism, was published in 2008, details the merging markets for walkable urbanism. Uh, he was also for 21 years the managing director and co-owner of RL RCLCO, formerly Robert Charles Lesser and Company, the largest independent real estate advisory firm in the country that today works on over 600 projects a year for developers, corporations, and municipalities. And he's also an op-ed contributor to the New York Times, written several articles for, for periodicals, including the Atlantic Monthly, Urban Land, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, Washington Monthly, Canada's National Post, and Los Angeles Times, among others. So please join me in welcoming Christopher Leinberger. <laughs> So why are all of you here? There's a you know, great parties that I just walked past. Oh, I'm the uh, warm-up act. You're all going out afterwards. I, I, I get it. We're here to talk about how to build the country and how this country is evolving in many different ways than we gray hairs remember. And um, so, and it's really critical to all sorts of different things that, that, that we're doing. Um, I'm not certain. Are we doing OK there? Or should I put this further away? Here, let me turn that off. Um, so what we're talking about is the fact that you've got a walkable urban future. And you are just barely starting the process, quite honestly. That and if I can be a little critical up front, that Austin is one of the best known, one of the most highly regarded cities and metropolitan regions in the country. But I'll tell you, you know, I, I've known Austin for many years, and the image and the reality don't line up. <laughs> um, and at some point, the outside world might figure that out. So I would hope that you would catch up the reality with the image sooner than later. What we're talking about with the built environment is uh, we're talking about the largest asset class in the entire economy. All your homes, this church building, the roads, uh, all the sewers uh, add up to at least 35% of the assets of the country. And it's the largest asset class. And when it collapses, the entire economy goes down in flames. As as we just demonstrated, as we in real estate once again demonstrated over the last few years. And in fact, one of the reasons that we're bumping along throughout the rest of the country at 2% growth rates is, primar is primarily because this asset class is not engaged. And as I'll show you tonight, it's because we in real estate and, and, the, uh, and the regulators and the place managers and uh, various providers of infrastructure, we have to relearn how to build this place. It's not the way that we've been building it in the last half of the 20th century. Because there's only two ways to build the built environment. There's, on the one hand, what we did before the Second World War in the late 19th century, early 20th century, which is what's referred to as walkable urban. This is higher density. It's where you can get most things within walking distance. And you have multiple transportation options. But it's, again, higher density, a walkable place. Well, after the Second World War, we started building this whole new way that we've never seen in the history of city building, which is, which is known as drivable suburban. Very low density. Everything's isolated from one another. And the only way to get any kind of connections is by cars and trucks. So in this country, we pushed the pendulum all the way over during the late 20th century. And we were giving the market what it wanted. This is not as if some, there, there was no conspiracy by GM, uh, though you might sometimes think of that. What you could consider that is that they are very clever marketers. Um, but we pushed this pendulum all the way over to just building drivable suburban places for decades and decades. And we in real estate figured out how to do this really well. Um, and we, in fact, created formulas. So that it, it's, it's what I call the 19 standard product types. 
that we developers learn throughout the country, and it's the same whether it's in Southern California, in Washington, or here in Austin. And so it first, of course, starts with freeways. And the reason for this is that transportation drives development. There are 15 infrastructure categories. First among equals is transportation. For the 6,000 years we've been building cities, the transportation system dictates what the form of the built environment is. And so we naturally, after the Second World War, learned how to build freeways. We pioneered that in this, in this uh, world. And it followed with subdivisions. And then, of course, we invented the regional mall. This is the uh, King of Prussia Mall outside of Philadelphia where, where, where I grew up. When my mother first took me here, Back in, the, back in the 60s. And she drove me on these freeways that had these off-ramps and on-ramps and, and went to the King of Prussia Mall. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. This was great. And I was thinking, wow, someday Philadelphia is going to be like a big city. It's going to be like Los Angeles. Well, we've, of course, learned how to um, build freeways even better. This is Dallas. And... Naturally, we've learned how to build low-density, drivable suburban even further and further out. So this is the drivable suburban future that we built. The market won it. We zoned for it. We gave it to them. Now, the best way to understand this, and this will just demonstrate how rigorous the Brookings Institution is, that with my interns and with my, the folks that work with me, the first thing I make them watch is Back to the Future. Um, Back to the Future is a great movie because it's the only popular movie that shows the two ways of building the built environment in the same movie. And so in this first uh, scene, we have Marty McFly, who um, is um, in Back to, goes back to 1955, downtown Hill Valley. Now keep in mind that this is a fake town. This was on the back lot of the Universal Studios. And they created this town, and this is, again, in the mid-'80s. So they're thinking, well, how do real estate developers name things? Oh, they name things after what they destroy to build on top of it. So Hill Valley, you take the hill, drop it into the valley. Um, but this shows their imagination about what a 1950s, really pre-Depression built downtown looks like and how it works. Pretty idyllic. Retail on the ground floor, probably housing up above. You can probably get there by obviously by car, by, um, by bicycle, by bus, in his case, skateboard. Um, but even in 1955, the seeds of change had been planted. Now, you have probably not seen this film 20 times like I have, but this was the billboard that he parked his DeLorean behind. This is the advertisement for the subdivision where he was born. So this was the first suburban subdivision in Hill Valley. So now this, so this next, I think there's a chair in the way of this. There we go. Um, so this next clip goes forward to 1985. And it, it's, it's an entirely different downtown. Instead of a vibrant downtown, homeless on the street, that beautiful plaza is now naturally a surface parking lot and X-rated theaters. So where he goes, he goes to the new town center, which is naturally the regional mall. Now, looking at this next clip, uh, think about, about the naming trick that I mentioned about, about, about us uh, developers, and also ask yourself what happens in this next clip that never happens in real life.
so that lone pine tree had to go. <laughs> and of course, in real life, nobody on foot goes down that driveway into the mall. But you can see these two ways of building the built environment, drivable suburban, isolated, modular, only connected by car, walkable urban. And that, that downtown is at least five times as dense as the drivable suburban places that, that are the, you know, the basis of, of the last 50 years. Now, the way that we've been building our country, if you know three things about any metropolitan area in this country, you'll be able to tell where the growth has gone over the last 50 years. Number one is, where is the white upper middle income housing concentration? And it's in that bubble in the center, you know, the concentration of executive housing. If you know where the local minority housing concentration is, which is on the other side of town, generally speaking, and if you know where we put the freeways, the major transportation system, transportation drives development, you'll know where the favored quarter is. The favored 90 degree arc coming out of downtown, it's that dashed uh, white line up there. The favored quarter in Atlanta goes to the north, in Phoenix it goes to the northeast, in Denver it goes to the south, in Washington DC it goes to the northwest, and here it goes to the northwest. And um, now, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, as, as we built out, according to this, we built these edge cities out there on the periphery, and you know, close to where the boss lived, because the boss didn't want to drive that far. And then the malls all went out there. And that worked fine, because the driving distances were not hellacious. It really got into the 90s and the 2000s when we went to the next ring out, to what are referred to as edgeless cities. And all of a sudden now, you have a situation where you can have, when times were really good, and of course times are pretty good down here now, that in the edge cities, you have unemployment rates of two, three, four percent, basically below full employment. And um, whatever you did, you dropped it. Um, and, um, Let's just hope that it doesn't click off. And, um, um, and so, um, but, but getting out to the jobs out there were virtually impossible for folks that lived on the, on the wrong side of town. That, um, and, and so you can have two, three, four percent unemployment out in, out in, out in the exurban fringe and 15, 20 percent unemployment closer into town. Because you just couldn't get there from here. And by the way, what this translates into is that for every 1% population growth, we'd see 6 to 8% land use consumption. Now, you here in Texas, just like the rest of the country, but particularly you here in Texas, have no shortage of land. We stole the land fair and square, and we have a lot of it. <laughs> and so we would use it and then throw it away and just keep on moving out. Now, part of this, this trend in, in the late 20th century I think is the largest social engineering project this country has ever engaged in. And now all domestic policy is social engineering. We're also the most charitable people in the world as far as charitable giving. And that's, that's reinforced by the federal policy that allows a tax deduction for giving to nonprofits. Um, most other countries don't do that. And that helps us be among the most charitable in the world. So domestic policy by its very nature is social engineering. This just happened to be the biggest social engineering project we've ever engaged in. And the first thing is, is that we only made drivable suburban the legal way to build. We made walkable urban illegal from a zoning point of view. I know this personally because I've done 12 projects and all 12 of them are walkable urban and all 12 of them were illegal when I proposed them. And I got to tell you, it gets really old proposing illegal things. It costs millions of dollars to get the zoning changes. Uh, one of those projects took seven years to, heaven forbid, build a walkable mixed-use project with, oh my god, alleys. People came up and said, alleys, that's where black people murder you. We can't have alleys. 
Again, race has always been a big factor in how we build our cities. The second thing is here we go is that we have massively subsidized drivable suburban infrastructure. That some, some surveys show it's between 10 and 20 times uh, subsidy for a drivable suburban household versus a walkable urban household. That, and, and again, we wanted to do this. We put these subsidies in place intentionally. But, but it, it just costs so much more to service a low density house or a low density business with the sewer line. You know, it costs the same amount to put a sewer line in whether you use it at one house per unit or one house per acre or whether you use it at 40 houses per acre. It's the same price. You just spread it over more units in a walkable urban place. So the way that we've done infrastructure, or at least how we've charged for it, is sort of as if your city council, who I met with three of them uh, today, if in their wisdom they decided that all restaurants in Austin must charge one price for whatever you eat and drink, we know that those of you out here that are on a diet and don't drink alcohol will be subsidizing those of you, and you know who you are, that'll pig out and get drunk. That's how we charge for infrastructure. And it's a very inefficient way of allocating a very precious public resource. But that's how we do it, and we've been doing it for years. And it's resulted in trillions of dollars going to drivable suburban development. And occasionally, we'll send a few billion dollars to save our cities. But it's a token amount of money. It's always failed. And primarily it failed, A, because it's a token amount of money, but really it failed because the market didn't want it in the 70s and 80s. We were heading for the hills. And then the other thing is, is that the financial industry got used to financing these 19 standard product types. You wanted to finance a subdivision, there was a banker who specialized in, in giving you construction loans for subdivisions. You wanted to do strip retail, there was another guy who specialized in strip retail. You wanted to do a mixed use project, you'd fry all their circuits. They'd show you the door. And then it's us in real estate that we got used to doing the, the simple formula-driven stuff. I liken it to that um, we in real estate, and this is particularly apt for you in Austin, that we in real estate got really good at driving Formula One race cars, where you are going straight, right, left at 200 miles an hour. We now have to learn how to fly fighter jets, where you're going straight, right, left, go up five miles or crash and burn going 600 miles an hour while you're being shot at. It's a fundamentally different skill set, much more complex, much more risky, and we're just learning how to do it. And same for your public officials, and, and same with the nonprofits that are involved with this. We're just learning over the last few years how to do it. Now, there's a lot of implications of this way that we've been spending the 35% of our wealth for half a century. And I could go into the public health aspects of this because the research is in that land use and our drivable suburban land use is responsible for somewhere between 40 and 50% of obesity, asthma, and diabetes. If you, there's a great image of somebody driving their car while out the window walking their dog. If you're doing that, you're obviously not engaging in unintentional, everyday physical activity. But another big one, which is the reason I'm involved with this business, is climate change. And we didn't know this when, when we started this social experiment. But we now know that um, about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions come from our buildings, and about 30% come from our transportation system, i.e. cars. So over 70% of greenhouse gas emissions is the result of the built environment. And we now know um, where that built environment, or where the different parts of the built environment are that, in fact, 
create most of this. And this is Chicago. And the blue is the city of Chicago. And on the heat map, red is, are, is naturally the drivable suburban fringe. The blue is a per household CO2 emissions. The blue is 2.5 tons per year. The red is 11.5 tons per year, nearly five times as much. The drivable suburban fringe is where, that wa is, is, is where the greenhouse gas emissions are the most intense. We didn't know this until recently. But this is, we, once we get serious about greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, the built environment is going to fundamentally change. Now, the market has shifted. That, in fact, let me see, did I skip, skip over one? Doesn't matter. That right now, since the mid-90s, the market wants walkable urban uh, development. It just began in, in the mid-90s. Mid it is picking up steam. It's got to fight all these barriers, all the subsidy barriers, the fact that it's illegal, the fact that it's complex. Other than that, it's easy. Um, but we know what's driving it. And you gray hairs out there, it's not the baby boomers. We know who to blame, and it's the kids. It's the damn kids. It's their fault. It's the millennials that want this. And the best way to see this is through the TV shows that, that we baby boomers grew up with versus what our kids grew up with. So back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we grew up with you know, Leave it the Beaver and Dick Van Dyke and the Brady Bunch all set in the suburbs. Hollywood does more consumer research than any uh, business in the, in the country, and they were trying to attract us to watch their shows by, by providing us aspirational ways of living. So this is my, I could have picked many, but I like, I love Lucy. And this particular version, uh, this particular um, uh, show is the January, the third week in January of 1957, when Lucy gets it into her head that she wants to leave the city and move out to the suburbs. So this first clip is her uh, coming up with this idea and sharing it with Ethel. Why not? It'd be great for little Ricky. And Grace took us to see the most wonderful house that's for sale, a quaint old early American. So this next clip is her um, looking out over the back lot at Universal Studios, feeling sorry for moving out of New York. And here, and here they are in Connecticut. Oh, no, I'm fine now that we're here. Gee, isn't this exciting? We're in our very own home. The first house we ever had. Now, Lucy made a mistake. The next week's show, she, uh, she, she, of course, invited Fred and Ethel to come out. Two shows later, they moved out to the, um, the uh, country, the so-called country, out to the first ring suburbs. And of course, they told all their friends about it. And isn't it great? They started moving out. What we all discovered, and again, we didn't know this, is that with drivable suburban, as you build more, the quality of life goes down. The next strip mall next to your subdivision, the next subdivision next to your subdivision, is not welcomed at all. You fight it. In fact, that explains the largest democratic movement of the last generation, which is the rise of neighborhood groups. And the rise of neighborhood groups was to stop drivable suburban development because of the more is less phenomenon. As you build more, the quality of life is reduced. So it's a rational uh, reaction to see the rise of these neighborhood groups. You know, when I was growing up, we had PTA, we had Boy Scouts, we didn't have neighborhood groups. But now virtually every neighborhood 
is, in fact, organized. Um, and it was because of this, of this phenomenon that as you build more drivable suburban, the quality of life goes down. So let's now go forward to what our kids were growing up with. Obviously, Seinfeld was a big, big one right at the beginning, but Friends, Sex, and the City. These were the popular shows that most of the millennials were being raised on. And it showed a kind of lifestyle that was unknown to the baby boomers. The baby boomers would look at the city and they would you know, look at Hill Street Blues and think, oh, I walk a block, I'm going to get murdered, mugged, killed, all within a block. Um, Seinfeld showed an entirely different way of living your life. And it also, by the way, shows a demographic change that many sociologists feel is one of the biggest changes of this last generation is the postponement of marriage and the postponement of having children. Hey, you notice they move where they do the interview on Jeopardy now? Yeah, it used to be right in the middle of Single Jeopardy. Now they do it right after Single Jeopardy. Yeah, it's much better, isn't it? Oh, no comparison. The only show about nothing. <laughs> but it shows just a, this, this great lifestyle that was, again, aspirational to all those suburbanites who were, who were in fact watching it. And this reflects this, this changing approach from the, from the millennials to living um, in a walkable urban place. But again, the baby boomers are still part of this, that as we, get, as we become empty nesters, as we become retirees, uh, we tend to downsize. Just yesterday, my wife and I uh, just sold our DuPont Circle townhouse, and we're moving into a West End, about four blocks away, condominium. And it's another downsizing for us. Um, and so we baby boomers are still on the stage, in spite of what you, what you, what you millennials and Gen Xers think, we're never leaving. <laughs> When you add up these two huge generations, which are more than half of all Americans, you look at the demographics. When the baby boomers were growing up, 50% of all households were singles and couples, six, uh, and 50% were families with children. Today, 75% of all households are singles and couples. 25% are families with children. Now, singles and couples are the target market for walkable urbanism, but it's not to say that families aren't welcome. There's a baby boom going on in a lot of walkable urban neighborhoods. I live close to Georgetown. Georgetown has these narrow sidewalks and this baby boom's going on and these millennials love these Cadillac strollers that take the entire sidewalk. You have to go into the street. Um, but looking into the future, over the next 20 years, the, the, the social or the demographers are estimating that as far as the marginal increase in households, just looking at the, just at the increase, only 14% of the net increase in households will have children living in, the, uh, uh, in those homes. 86% will be singles and couples. So the world's fundamentally changed. The other thing is just sheer boredom. Uh, you here in Austin, uh, and particularly 10 years ago, certainly it's changing now, but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you moved to Austin and you had choice, you could live in a single family home or a single family home. And if you wanted to go shopping for groceries, you could drive to a 1980s strip mall or drive to a 1990s strip mall, any place you want to go. You didn't have any choice. And the market is demanding, give me a choice. The creative class is certainly driving this as well. The creative class is demanding FaceTime. The, the creative class wants to be in a diverse situation. And as Richard Florida has demonstrated pretty well, that, that if you don't provide the, walk, you know, the option of urbanism, you're going to be out of luck as far as attracting the creative class. And to me, from an economic development point of view, attracting the creative class is the key to success in the knowledge economy and in the next economy, which is the experience economy. And then finally, it's sheer economics. It's paying for a, paying for a fleet of cars 
to participate in society. That a drivable suburban household, on average in this country, spends 25% of its household income to pay for all the cars. In fact, there's a great image that Peter Calthorpe has um, of this beat to, beat to hell house with five cars parked in the parking lot. Uh, you know, the cars together, as far as the cash flow needed to carry those cars, is far more than the house. Um, and there are census tracts in this country where the, you know, the average household is paying 35 and 40% of their household income, which means that they are driving to work so they can make money, so they can afford to make their car payments, so they can drive to work. Not a great way to build household uh, uh, wealth. Uh, by the way, walkable urban households, on average, spend 9% of their household income on transportation. You drop one car out of your household. The AAA says it's $9,200 per year to own and occupy or to, to, to own and service a car. Car payments, gas, insurance, parking, da 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 da. That's $12,000 per year. Uh, as, because you have to earn $12,000 and then pay taxes and then you pay off $9,200. You turn that into a mortgage, you can increase your mortgage capacity by $150,000, which is generally an appreciable asset rather than a car, which is always a depreciable asset. This thing is really not working well. So um, the one thing that we've seen in this country over the last 50, 60 years is that the growth in GDP has always gone in lockstep with how much we drive. The most common measure is vehicle miles traveled, VMT. And so the GDP goes up 3%, vehicle miles traveled goes up 3%. And, but that was the case until the mid-90s, when all of a sudden we began to see a divergence, first time ever. And in fact, we're now seeing a decline in vehicle miles traveled in this country. You know, the, the, the country that glorified the cars, is, we're now driving less in absolute terms, in spite of the fact that we're growing at about 1% per year as far as population growth. We peaked in 2004, we're now down 6%. For the young people, between 18 and 34, their driving peaked in 2001. It's down 23%. And this, again, this huge population uh, boom moving into that age category. So on a per capita basis, they probably drop their, their driving by 33%. From a social science point of view, that's falling off a cliff. This is all part of this change in how we're building the built environment. And because ultimately, the software that I downloaded to run this program didn't get to me by car and truck. The knowledge economy requires a whole lot less as far as motorized transport. What we're seeing, though, is we don't have enough walkable urban places. We need a whole lot more. As a result, we're seeing this pent-up demand result in tremendous price premiums for great walkable urban places. And I'm seeing lines cross across the country um, I'm not certain. Can you see that? You have to believe me. Um, <laughs> this is Denver. I was trying to show off a, a, a downtown adjacent place that was a slum 30 years ago versus a master plan community built around golf courses out in the favored quarter, 30 miles outside of town. And in 1996, uh, that master plan community was worth a whole lot more on a price per square foot basis than that recovering slum. Today, that downtown adjacent place is far more expensive than that master plan community. The lines have crossed, and we're seeing that in Washington. We're seeing that in Denver. We're seeing that this is Columbus, Ohio, of all places, where a, a place called Short North, which was a ghetto 20 years ago, is now a hip, arts-oriented, walkable urban place, far more expensive than the former highest uh, sales price a suburban place called Worthington. Um, so what we have, what you have in Austin, is you've got walkable urban places and drivable suburban. And you've got places that are, that are local serving, your bedroom communities, 
and regionally significant places. And I would urge you to really focus on just the walkable urban over the next generation. That's where the market wants to go. And according to my research, generally speaking, it's only 10% of your landmass is walkable urban. And about 8-9% of that's going to be your bedroom communities that are walkable urban. Probably most of you live in walkable urban communities now that are local serving bedroom communities. And, but only 1% are the walkable urban places that play a regionally significant role in wealth generation here in Austin. Your downtown is one example of, uh, of that. So in the upper left-hand corner are, is, is, is that 1% of your metropolitan region where, if my numbers are right, is where your economic future is. And you've got to get those places right, and you need a whole lot more of them. By my guess, you've got four or five regionally significant walk-ups, walkable urban places. So there are six types of these regionally significant walkable urban places. And this was kind of surprising that you've got downtowns, of course, your downtown. You've got downtown adjacent places, all the places that are just around downtown, walking distance to downtown, but they have different character, uh, generally some very funky places. You've got urban commercial. These are former local serving uh, a, a, a commercial districts 100 years ago, they went down as far as their economic uh, competitiveness. They were mainly abandoned. They've now come back as urban entertainment places and boutiques. Those are in the center city. In the suburbs, we're seeing also a significant investment in walkable urban places. One are the suburban town centers. These are towns that were 19th century farm towns, ranch towns here that got swept up in the sprawl. They went downhill when the, when the Walmart opened, when the regional mall opened. They're now beginning to come back, building on that pre-automobile grid and some great historic buildings that have memory and people are willing to invest in and bring back. This is gonna be the big one, the conversion of strip commercial. And you've got one of the best examples in the country underway with, with, uh, with uh, Highlands Mall. And anchored by the community college, I've, I've never seen this particular model yet. And what we've known about at higher ed is that higher education has been a phenomenal anchor for great walkable urban places over the last 30 years. In fact, you look at the US News and World Report, just came out last week with the rankings once again. And over the last 30 years, almost all of the, of the schools that have risen in the ranks are urban schools. Why? Because of the millennials. It's their target market. They would much rather go to a hip urban school than some outstanding in their cornfield place. And so the community college taking over that mall and putting a mixed use, hopefully mixed income place around it is gonna be a phenomenal national model um, that I'm gonna track quite closely. But there's 10,000 dead, dead or dying malls in this country, and they make a natural place to convert into walkable urban places. And then finally, there's going to be a few greenfield developments. These are, you just add water and poof, you have instant urbanity. They get criticized a lot because they sort of look like Disneyland, and they were kind of like, and they are Disneyland. Um, but you're not going to see too many of them. They're really expensive to, to pull off. And obviously, they don't have a whole lot of what the, what the millennials are really looking for, authenticity. They aren't authentic. Uh, in 100 years, they will be. <laughs> the thing about real estate, which is great, is that age legitimizes. And that's why we keep historic buildings. Too bad it doesn't happen with us as people. Age does not <laughs> legitimize us. Um, so here are the walkable urban places in Metro DC, and you can see these six types. You have downtown, and, uh, which has been a phenomenal turnaround story. 
uh, 20 years, uh, 15 years ago, there were 90 surface parking lots in downtown, like you have in abundance here. <laughs> Today, there are zero, all built out. Then you have the downtown adjacent places. Again, surrounding the, the downtown, DuPont Circle, the West Ends, uh, Capitol Riverfront, Capitol Hill. Then you have the urban commercial. Then you have the uh, suburban town centers like uh, Bethesda, Silver Spring. Then here are the, uh, all the uh, strip commercial redevelopment. The biggest one right in, in the center, that big red one, is Tyson's Corner, the largest suburban concentration in the world, 44 million square feet, otherwise known as the dreaded Tyson's Corner, because every, everybody hates it. It used to be the king of the hill 20 years ago in DC, and downtown was way downhill. It's just reversed. So much so, and this is something that I would urge you to consider doing here as well, that the property owners in Tyson's Corner realized that they were completely out of the running. They've ponied up 25% of the cost to build the metro rail to come out to Tyson's. About a billion dollars, private sector, contributing to build the metro rail and a lot of other street improvements and, and, and streetcar uh, improvements because they knew that if they didn't do it, they couldn't convert to becoming walkable urban and they wouldn't be able to compete with downtown and all the other great walkable urban places. So probably Tyson's Corner is going to probably turn into three, maybe four walkable urban places because it's, I mean, that's a blob up there. It's 2,400 acres. The average size of these things is about 400 acres. And it's, and it's confined by walkability. We only want to walk 1,500 to 3,000 feet. And then here are the uh, greenfield sites. There are about four of them. And again, we're not going to see too many of those. Don't get too excited about greenfield. Most of the growth initially went into the favored quarter. Uh, obviously, all the drivable suburban stuff went into the favored quarter, but even with the early phase of the walkable urban went into the favored quarter. But now something's happening that I think is one of the most significant social events of our age, which is we're beginning to see private investment go outside of the favored quarter. That the metro rail lines are getting, are getting close to a capacity. And the green line that serves the northeast and the southeast in the non-favored quarter is beginning to attract private sector investment. So we're beginning to see private sector investment and jobs go to the east side of town, which would be every bit as, you know, it's the same thing here, going east of 35, um, which is what hopefully we'll see throughout the country. So this is the future of this country. It's walkable urban places. And Quite honestly, you know, the research shows that you should have somewhere between seven and eight regionally significant walkable urban places for every million of population. You've got about two million here, so you should have about 15 of them. Again, I count four, five, six right now. The real question is where are the missing 10? And it's where your future economy is going to be, and it's where you're going to have the, you know, the best hope of building a mixed income walkable urban place that is both healthy and will be socially equitable and will begin to bring and will begin to bridge this, 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 this east-west divide that you have here. So what you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago used to be a niche market is now the market. And I think it's going to fundamentally change this country and hopefully begin to bring this country finally back together again. Thank you very much.
uh, step up to the podium, but for uh, Channel 6 purposes, in order to feed an audio to the recording, which we are recording tonight, uh, we are asking individuals to make their way around over to the podium. If you have a question, we've got about uh, 20 minutes for questions here tonight. Thank you. And if you are needing this microphone, please just raise your hand and I will find you in the audience. When I was born in the late 50s, our population was about 185 million, and now it's roughly, it's over 300 million. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, what population density should we expect in these walkable urban areas in order to accommodate the continuing growth in our population? Mm -hmm. I don't know if very many of you know the term or the um, the measurement floor area ratio FAR. For those of you that don't, it's a very simple calculation that if you have a, you know a ten thousand square foot piece of dirt and you build ten thousand square feet worth of building, the FAR is one point zero. If you have a ten thousand square foot piece of dirt and build a two thousand square foot building, you have a FAR of point two. And if you build a 20,000 square foot on that 10,000 square foot piece of dirt, you have an FAR of 2.0. So drivable suburban density is on average about 0.2. It ranges from about 0.05 to 0.4. Walkable urban density starts at about 1.0. And so, and, and, and that's in the regionally significant walkable urban places. Starts at about 1.0. The Hill Valley, the downtown of Hill Valley is about 1.0. So it's not an overwhelming, I mean, we're not talking about Manhattan here. We're not going to see a repeat of Manhattan probably in this country. We'll see it in China, certainly. We're seeing it in China. Um, but in this country, really, the kind of density we're looking at that will really absorb most of the growth in this country over the next generation. Again, it's only, it's, it, it can be absorbed in the 10% of your current urbanized land for the next generation. And the densities are going to be between 1.0 FAR and maybe 4.0. It's not going to be super high density, I don't think. I mean, obviously downtown you might get a little bit higher than that. Obviously some of these towers are pretty amazing. Um, but. Uh, you're, you're not going to see, but you're going to be able to fit all that growth as we go from 310 million. We're going to be in, in uh, between 2040 and 2050, we're going to be at 500 million. So we've got to put those folks someplace. And if we put those folks um, out on the fringe, we're just asking for it as far as climate change and all the rest of the problems that we'll face with that. My name is Scott Johnson. Thank you for your presentation. With regard to policies for recruitment of new, medium sized, and large manufacturing businesses or expansion of manufacturing or tech businesses, do those recruitment policies that are often taken, uh, the lead role by the Chamber of Commerce or the city's economic department, do that necessarily always work against suburban walkability or could it work? towards improving suburban walkability? There are two schools of thought. In fact, I just composed a letter at the request of Mayor Bloomberg to his foundation about this very issue. Um, two schools of thought about economic uh, development. The prevailing school of thought is, and I'm going to probably piss off a lot of people here, um, is, you know, it falls under a variety of categories that, you know, smokestack chasing, uh, subsidizing corporations to move to, uh, to a place, um, basically attempt 
to buy the company to come to your place. And quite honestly, I don't see that as a particularly effective method of trying to get more economic development. Because when you look at the, I used to do a lot of work with corporate real estate executives. And you look at all the surveys of what they think about when they make their move, incentives are about number eight on their top 10 list. It's basically, if you're gonna give me a lot of money, okay, I'll take it, twist my arm. But it's not really that important. What's important is the quality of the workforce. That's number one. So my school of thought, what I more subscribe to, is invest in the place. Make yourself so attractive, particularly to the millennials, because they're the one, I mean, that's obviously the future. Not only the future for those companies, but the future of the entrepreneurial class that will create the companies. I don't know, I, I don't have a crystal ball of what industries are going to drive the knowledge economy or the experience economy. I have no clue. What I do know is that young people that are in the creative class are gonna dream up those companies and you want to attract them. And then, you know, they come here first because you're hip and cool. And then they create the companies of the future. So if you're going to have a choice between subsidizing, you know, GM or subsidizing your parks and schools, I'd subsidize your parks and schools. Amen. Thank you for your talk tonight. Um, my question has to do with new urbanism and development and urban revitalization often being synonymous with gentrification. Mm -hmm. And do you foresee a total reversal of the concentrations of wealth with an urban center and the, the six types of walk-ups being wealthy to moderately wealthy and then impoverished, previously impoverished urban centers being pushed, those populations being pushed to those vacated fringes and those vacated subdivisions? And if so, how or if do cities want to develop socially responsibly and conscious of, of that issue? I actually paid her to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote an article for The Atlantic that was entitled The Next Slum four years ago about the emergence of slums in this country on the drivable suburban fringe. These places are, and particularly in the non-favored quarter, are monocultures, that they're reliant upon the growth of subdivisions and reliant upon a residential tax base that's cratering. The, 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 um, the Great Recession was caused by the collapse of the mortgage market. The collapse of the mortgage market was caused by the collapse of the drivable suburban fringe. That's where the foreclosures were. Yes, there were foreclosures in town, in poor neighborhoods, where all those unscrupulous practices were engaged in, but from a sheer numbers point of view, it was the drivable suburban fringe, those people that drove until they qualified, paying 25, 35% of their incomes for transportation, and then had to pay the mortgage, which then spiked when they're low. And those places, you know, the problem is, 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 that those, is that the market value of those homes are now below replacement value. <clears throat> Which means, and, and to me that's the definition of a slum, or an evolving slum, when the market price is below replacement price. So when the roof goes, you patch it. The kitchen that was put in 20 years ago is the kitchen that's there today. And it just downward spiral. As for, and, and so there's no reason to maintain it because any dollar you put into that house, you're not going to get out of it. You're not going to get that dollar back, so why put it in? So there is the possibility of that happening, but the table's set. Those houses exist. They're not gonna be bulldozed. The, um, the thing that we have to do, and I didn't share this with you, but part of the research that I just released last week was a ranking system of walkable urban places based upon two criteria. One is economics, and one is social equity. And the ideal, is to have outstanding economic performance and outstanding social equity. The economic performance is something that we better understand. We're not perfect yet, because we're still learning how to build these places, but we better understand the economics. And of course, we in real estate 
and property owners and the city who lives off of the property taxes are all encouraged to just make these places better and better from an economic point of view. What I think we also have to do is put a conscious affordable housing strategy in all of these walkable urban places. And to me, the best way to do that, you're, you know, the Downtown Austin Association is a place manager. We have a missing level of governance in our society. You know, the Founding Fathers were brilliant, but with six million people versus 310 million people, things change. And the missing level of governance, not government, governance, is the place level. Those 400 acre places all need place management, 24 7 place management. And so the DAA, as well as other business improvement districts, they are creator, or they've been created by the city. There's state legislation that allows the city to create what you call PIDs or BIDs or whatever you want to call them. And they should be charged with conscious affordable housing strategies for, for these places. And now we have measures. You can say, you know, the city council, every five years they get rechartered. And the city council can say, we want you to move up in the rankings of your social equity. And one way to do that, and this is something I did in downtown Albuquerque um, when I was redeveloping downtown Albuquerque. I, as I think I mentioned, I lived in Santa Fe for a number of years and was involved with the redevelopment of downtown Albuquerque, is that we set up the Albuquerque Civic Trust, a nonprofit intentionally to create affordable housing and affordable commercial space. And I gave 15% of the ownership of my properties in downtown to the Albuquerque Civic Trust. And I encourage all the other property owners downtown to do the same thing. So as the place is gentrifying, right from the get-go, the rich are subsidizing the Albuquerque Civic Trust that will build the affordable housing. Basically, gentrification can pay for affordable housing. So, it's not a perfect approach, and there's 14 other ways that, you know, inclusionary zoning, uh, which is illegal in this state, and making granny flats happen, and you know, there's 14 other ways that you can create affordable housing, but you need a conscious effort to apply and make it happen. Because the market, by the way, wants it. The market doesn't want to live in golden ghettos. They want a diverse community. Long answer to a short question, but a very important question. Can you talk a little bit about uh, density bonuses and uh, specifically whether you consider them to incentivize density or penalize it? Hmm. Um, it obviously depends on the market as to whether it incentivizes or disincentivizes um, that generally speaking density bonuses are used when the, the, the developer feels that there's more market than he can that he can legally build to. And so those air rights are owned by we the people, and we can use those air rights to uh, extract certain trade-offs, like, af like affordable housing. Um, the District of Columbia has a height limit, and there's some discussion about what do we do with that height limit. I mean, you know, downtown's built out now. The downtown adjacent places, because of the height limit, because there's a limit, you just, there's a physical limit to how much you can build. You can never go above 12 stories. Um, and the, uh, basically, all those air rights belong to me and the rest of the citizens of D.C., and they're worth about $100 to $150 per square foot for each floor of those air rights. You add that up, it's tens of billions of dollars. That's... Even in Washington, that's real money. <laughs> um, so we, we need to talk about that because if we can free up that money to put into the schools, to put into the rail transit, to put into affordable housing, it, it's worthy of discussion. And especially, as I said, the downtown and downtown adjacent places within 15 years are built out because it's, you know, this walkable urban trend is so advanced in DC, it's moving so quickly. <clears throat> There's about 50 cranes in the sky, and they're primarily rental apartments and office buildings, but primarily rental apartments going up, just as is happening here. So it all depends on the market. 
Hi there. Um, I moved here from Dayton, Ohio about three years ago. My uh, in-laws so live in Dayton. Uh, my uh, niece and, and, and they're trying to sell their house and they can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's the exact opposite of, of Austin. Yeah. Um, my question is, what happens when downtowns fail, uh, like Dayton has? Uh, downtown Austin right now has you know, a slew of buildings that are under development, uh, tech companies moving into the core. What does the city have to do to make sure that uh, the urban core stays vibrant? And does that mean really investing in transportation, do you think? The biggest disappointment, besides the fact that the image and, and the reality on the ground here in Austin don't line up, the biggest disappointment I've had coming down here is that your mayor has taken rail transit off the bond measure. In not investing in rail transit is akin to not investing in the freeways in the 1960s. It's a, it is the most important uh, transportation infrastructure of the early 21st century. And you're going to put it in. The question is, are you going to put it in before your competition does or not? And every year that you postpone it means there's more square footage that's being built that is not taking advantage of this. The reason you build transportation systems is to drive economic development. It's not to move people. The reason you put in transportation people, uh, systems, and particularly rail transit, is not to move people. The means is moving people. The end is economic development at the stations. And if you're not putting in that, that vital infrastructure, you're not going to get that economic development. And we know that, um, that you know, commuter rail is of marginal impact as far as economic development. We just don't have very many examples throughout the country of, of, of economic development and high-density walkable urban development taking place around a commuter rail station. Only 20% of all trips are to work. 80% are, are to go get milk and to take your kids to school and to band practice and to cheerleading practice and to everything else you take your kids to because they can't walk any place. That's why obesity is so terrible with our kids. Um, and, but we do know that streetcars, light rail, and subways really, really, really pay for themselves. And by the way, they are much cheaper on a supportable square foot basis or, a per, or on a per unit basis, however you want to measure it, than putting that next freeway in or, putting, or replacing that freeway interchange that you never think, you know, you have to put in a new, you know, one of the freeway uh, where two freeways meet, it becomes obsolete. Spend a billion dollars replacing it. You don't think about it. Oh, well, you gotta do it. Billion dollars with rail transit, what it could do, and, and the economic development that it would spur um, you know, I was told never to mention this in this town, but I will. Um, because you have Portland fatigue, I know that. Um, but the streetcar example, and, and Portland is not the be all and end all. Um, I mean, their suburbs are not particularly urbanized. Obviously, you know, great stories downtown and downtown adjacent. But they put in the $55 million streetcar line into the Pearl District. It's just a remarkable story. $55 million streetcar, $3.5 billion of private sector investment over the next 10 years. And of, the, and of the housing that went in, half of it was affordable or workforce housing. I've never seen that happen any place. Um, and the city just said, you want the streetcar? Make the Pearl District look like the region as a whole. We don't want it to be a golden ghetto. And they did it. It's remarkable. For $55 million, that's, you know, that's, that's a day of the Afghan war. Um, and to go into a streetcar. And it's many, you know, it's 200 times that billion dollars that builds that interchange. Um, if you put a streetcar between downtown and the UT campus, along that line, you would see a boom that you would never have guessed. Uh, both at the terminuses and along the line. That's the great thing about streetcars, by the way, is that it's even development. On, the, on two or three blocks on either side of the rail lines, it's even development as it, as it densifies. Um, and then, again, light rail and subways. 
And if you say we can't afford subways, I say, well, you're not thinking big enough because everybody else on the planet can. Why can't Americans afford subways for a town that's two, that's two million? I, I was just in Nuremberg in Germany. It's about this size. They have an extensive subway system. We are 30% on a per capita basis more wealthy than the Germans. They can put it in, why can't we? I'm a city councilman up in Miami, which is hopefully home of one of these greenfield areas you talked about. <laughs> um, we're at the end of the rail line. Um, we are in Williamson County up there, which projections show maybe, you know, some projection 25, 30 years from now could be as large or larger than Travis County. So we've got the population moving out there. Um, I guess the question would be is, okay, so we have one of those. We've got 2,300 acres that's in the smart code, where they, you know, centered around the rail station. You talk about how difficult it is, what, and we are seeing some of that. What are some of the things that we can do, or what do you have any, as far as recommendations in that area? And then the second item on it is, what is the value of us doing some smaller scale, more mixed use type in, you know, you've got that big large area, but then also mixing in mixed use, trying to bring in some of that, and do you see value in that, in, that, in more of the suburban areas? Well, you've got the commuter rail there now, we don't have very many examples of commuter rail sparking private sector uh, development in this country. We just don't have it. I mean, I, I know most of the commuter rail systems in, in the country. And again, it's because it's pretty much just active in the morning and in the evening. It is not as if, if, you're going, if, if your child's gonna go to school if, um, if, if, if you want to go out to lunch at, uh, uh, during the midday, it doesn't help you. Therefore, you need your car. Therefore, you know, what good does it do you? Um, even the old legacy systems in New York and Philadelphia, Boston and, and, and Chicago, they've sparked local serving walkable urban development, but not regionally significant. So we just don't have that many examples. I mean, I wish we did. I, I wish it worked better because it's, it's a much cheaper way of... Uh, so to me, the thing is, it all comes back to frequency of service. That if you could get like a streetcar with a five minute headway, uh, which you're never gonna get, if you're gonna, like a light rail system that you can get a 10 minute headway, which is improbable, um, then you're not gonna be able to give the level of service that the market's demanding to really spark that. Now, it could be used as kind of a faux fireplace. You know, a fireplace in your house is what you orient. It's the excuse to orient your furniture around it, even though, you know, 1% you know, of the time you actually have a fire going, but 99% of the time your, your furniture orients around the fireplace uh, or your TV. <laughs> um, and so the train station becomes that fireplace and becomes that organizing principle. And it could be, a, you know, really elegant, um, icon that you know you could focus on, um, but that's kind of an architectural nuance as opposed to a practical everyday thing. So it's you know I hate to say it, but the reality is is that commuter rail just doesn't spark a whole lot. Neither do does a bus rapid transit. That if you think that you're going to somehow get out and, and and do it cheaply by bus rapid transit. I have seen billions of dollars invested in rail transit. I mean, streetcars and light rail and subways. I've seen billions of dollars invested. I have yet to see one dollar of private money invested at a bus stop. It's just not something that Americans want. Buses are viewed as um, something that only low-class people ride. The trains, different story. Now, maybe we'll, you know, Europeans and, and, uh, and the South Americans love buses, and they that's a different story, but we in this country view buses as, we should probably engage in truth and advertising with our public bus system, that we should probably put only ye that should enter, or only ye who can enter to, you know, over the door, uh, because we only, you know, we basically have, have, have bus systems so we can, uh, you know, give something for the poor to get around. So we've degraded that's, uh, that kind of system. I'm gonna uh, challenge our speaker to answer our last two questions here in 10 sentences or running very short. <laughs> We're being thrown at. Who's the best part of it? Yeah. 
My question uh, goes back to roads. Uh, even with the dense urban areas and like you've got up here, we still need viable roads uh, to bring in all of the milk and cat litter and yep. tuna fish and TV sets that people want to buy at all the shops and stores that are in these dense mm -hmm. urban areas. Yep. Yep. With um, people driving less and gas mileage going up, gas tax receipts are going down. So how do we pay for the roads that we need to supply all the stuff that we want to buy? The Wall Street Journal just had a special section on that, an entire section on how do we replace the gas tax, because you've just laid out the problem with gas tax. It's the, the least popular tax. It's also, as we all know, the lowest, this country pays the lowest gas tax of any country on the planet, a fraction of what anybody else pays. Um, but we're cheapskates, and we want things subsidized. We want somebody else to subsidize us. Um, and so we've got to re find a replacement. You know, quite honestly, you know, this may sound heretical, particularly in Texas, but we don't need many, if any, new roads in our system. We're going to have a hard enough time maintaining the roads we have. And as the VMT drops, we're going to need those roads less. And yes, we need roads. I mean, this is a portfolio of transportation options. Roads are going to be very important for a long time to come. And cars are great. They give you tremendous freedom. What I don't like about cars is that right now, again, the social engineering is you must drive a car. That's your only choice. Don't even think about anything else, which is what our system is laid out for right now. Um, so we need to find a way to maintain those roads. And whether it's a gas tax or a VMT tax, which is probably a more fair thing, for every mile you drive, you pay what it really costs to drive that mile. Uh, we're we're going to have to find a different system. But ultimately, that's not the question. The question is, how do we find the money to build the rail transit and the bike lanes? I didn't mention bike lanes. Really important. Bike lanes, are, they should be 20, 30 percent mode split in our towns. It is a really uh, unbelievably cheap, efficient, healthy, and from a developer point of view, you don't have to build all the parking decks. You put in a bike room. It's dirt cheap. So bikes, I didn't well, uh, really highlight that, but it's, it's a big answer. Very quickly now. Okay. Thanks for bringing up bikes. That was something I was going to comment on. But um, I live in, south, in, the, uh, in Zilker, which is just off of South Lamar, and we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, there's going to be a lot more condominiums, a lot more people that are moving in here. And there's a lot of concern in the neighborhood um, because that means more cars. And there's also a lot of the mixed use needs. People are coming and they are you know, going to the bars and they're parking in people's, you know, on their streets and they're stumbling around in their yards. And, and so there's this feeling, that's why we wanted this separation between residential and commercial. Um, can you speak to how to help us get through this transition time? A little bit better. And I think Austin needs some advice right. on that. Urban entertainment, i.e., drinking until you puke, um, <laughs> is not a way to build a great walkable urban place. It's, it's good to pioneer an area that's down and out and doesn't have neighbors, but if you continue that for 10, 20, 30 years, you're just going to be stuck there. And you'll never evolve into a more complex, vital, walkable urban place. So urban entertainment has its role. And nightclubs have their roles. Um, but a concentration of them, and particularly if they're not managed. Again, as I mentioned, place management is really important. And you can have nightclubs in walkable urban places. They just have to be properly sited, not on the edges of the walkable urban area, but um, you know, in the office concentrations, in the hotel concentrations, not where people want to go to bed like mere mortals at 10 o'clock, unlike the people that don't mind going to bed at 4, face down. Um, <laughs> so it's place management really takes care of that. And so, you know, having somebody to manage that neighborhood is a really important thing. As far as the condominiums go, the thing, you know, I think I mentioned about Arlington. 
I've had six speeches today, so I'm not certain what I've mentioned, but <laughs> did I mention about Arlington and the traffic counts in Arlington? Long story short, Arlington, Virginia, smallest county in the country, 208,000 people though, smallest in physical size, quadrupled the density of their failing strip commercial. The car dealers moved out, the Sears moved out, everything collapsed, the tax base was crumbling. Transit-oriented development, five metro stops, overlay zoning, quadrupled the density, and um, because of great place management, the absolute um, car counts on the main drag, Wilson Boulevard, over the last 20 years has gone down because all that new density was people walking, taking transit, and biking. They have a great bike share system. They're part of the DC bike share system. Um, so if you have the transportation portfolio system where people can get rid of their cars, or I mean, at least one car out of their household, you can deal with that increased density coming in as far, but you, it, you really need place management to deal with the, um, the, the uh, nightclubs. Um, Adams Morgan is the same place up, up in DC and they have not changed. And it's, it's really hurting them because they're stuck as a drink until you puke sort of place. Thank you very much. I'm Harvey Stoller with the Planning and Development Review Department. I'm the uh, bookend partner that Dr. Wong talked about at the introduction. Um, I'm up here to thank all of you for coming. This is a phenomenal turnout. I also want to thank again our partners. They, they've just, just done an excellent job getting the word out. Um, I'd also be remiss not to recognize a few individuals that are here tonight. Uh, Pam Larson and Robert Anderson and um, <clears throat> to have just done a phenomenal job of uh, uh, organizing this event. And uh, Diane Miller uh, has helped us with uh, uh, recruiting our partners. Carol Haywood uh, has been uh, interested in health and planning and their relationships for years. She's a nurse and she's kind of been the inspiration of partnering with the uh, health department. But most importantly, I want to tell you that this is a kind of a kickoff session to uh, continue the interest in uh, implementing the newly adopted comprehensive plan, Imagine Austin. This is to be a series of, of events. We're hoping to host uh, additional speakers. We're very interested in your ideas for subject matter. Uh, we started with uh, walkable urbanism because that's the theme of the plan. But I know transportation is of interest. I know environment is of interest. Neighborhood is of interest. Compatibility. Um, just let, let us know um, if you have any ideas for subject matter and speakers, because we want, we want to make this a continuing event. Uh, so thanks again for coming. Catherine, uh, Catherine Greger has an announcement. Please stay, this is very important. The Congress for the New Urbanism, Central Texas Chapter, is uh, inviting you to a meetup at the Stephen F. Bar at the Stephen F. Austin Hotel if you'd like to keep the conversation going, talk about how to apply these ideas right here in Austin, Texas. Uh, it's a no host event, but come buy a drink or some nachos and let's talk about how we do this on the ground. Thank you.